Hi, um, welcome to my summary of Hobbes Leviathan. Um, the the primary chapters I'm going to talk about are uh, the, the the first two parts, so of man and of commonwealth. But I am going to talk about the others too, um, but only to a smaller degree. Uh, this is the colour scheme. Um, I'm not going to go into it, but if you are trying to look for a specific thing, these are the colours I use. Okay, let's just dive right in because this is quite a long one. So this is the frontispiece, um, kind of like the front cover of Leviathan from when it was published, um, which was in 1651. So, although this this is a later um, frontispiece, but anyway. So um, you can start from the top left up, um, and go clockwise. So um, the... Latin writing at the top is a quote from the book of Job, which says, there is no power on earth to be compared to him. This, uh, uh, the book of Job is, is talking about a monster called Leviathan, um, which is obviously the title of the, of the book. So immediately this is saying that this figure that is looming at the, the top of the image is like this monster, the, the Leviathan. Um, the Lumen Commonwealth is imagined as one person whose body is formed from a mass of homunculi with the head of a sovereign king. So if you see in his arms and body, there's just loads of human beings. Um, but they all comprise this one person. And then the head is just one man. And this this represents the theory of sovereignty and the theory of Commonwealth that um, we will discuss and all of the individual people in this image are facing inwards so that you cannot see their features. Uh, in a 1651 manuscript created for Charles II, the people were facing outwards with a variety of expressions. So this is kind of almost further dehumanising them, making them, they're, they're turning inwards, they're facing into the Commonwealth. They're not, um, they're kind of almost not people face with with their own faces um apart from him apart from the sovereign okay um uh now we're going to look at the the two things he's holding in, in his hand so he holds the symbols of both secular and spiritual power so the left is a sword and the right is i can't remember the official word for it but it's, it's a sort of scepter that um represents ecclesiastical authority um and on earth so this is showing the union of these two elements within the sovereign he's he's in charge of both these two powers and then the bottom half of the of the um picture is a triptych um and it's just kind of showing the different things so it's showing on the left hand on the left side, secular power, and on the right side, the powers of the church, to again convey the two, the union of these two elements in the sovereign. Um, so yeah, you can see what they are there. Okay, so it begins with the dedication, and he says, to my most honoured friend, Mr Francis Godolphin. So uh, Francis Godolphin's brother, Mr Sidney Godolphin, enjoyed Hobbes' studies when he was alive. This dedication is in honour of him and in devotion to Francis. Um, he says that not everyone will like what he's about to say because some people favour too much liberty and others too much authority. So he's already sort of setting himself up, almost as kind of like a centrist in his mind, although I think some would disagree. He says, I speak not of men, but in the abstract of the seat of power. Um, this is, again, it's not... In his mind, this is the sort of... Um, objective discussion of power um and it's not it's not supposed to be emotional not supposed to be about men um it's supposed to be kind of removed from those things and then he signs it off in paris april 1651 um the introduction he says that nature which is the art whereby god made and governs the world can make art an artificial animal um life is just a motion of limbs and therefore all automata have artificial life he says that art goes even further, imitate, imitating man. For by art is created that great leviathan called the commonwealth or state, in Latin civitas, which is but an artificial man. The use of the word artificial um, is a significant rejection of Aristotle's contention that the polis is natural. 
Um, so again, we can kind of see at this point in time, there had been a change. Um, well, so the, the late 16th century, early 17th century. So this is, Holbein is kind of coming at the end of this change, but there had been a change away from Aristotelian scholastic um like thought as the as the as the sort of dominant school of thought um particularly about politics but and ethics and and all that um and now this is sort of rejecting this that aristotelian tradition quite strongly so he's kind of following the trends of his time um he says that but uh, so this the, um, the state is an artificial man, and in this, the sovereignty is an artificial soul. Um, magistrates and other officers are the joints. Reward and punishment is the nerves. Wealth is the strength. People's safety is the business. The councillors are the memory. Equity and laws are the reason and will. Concord is health. Sedition is sickness. And civil war is death. Uh, and this inclusion of civil war is significant because it's very heavy on his on Hobbes's mind at this point because the English civil wars had been um I, th- that date is wrong basically it's, it's from 1642 to 1648 sorry I, I changed it in my other notes but I didn't change it on here anyway the English Civil Wars was 1642 to 1648 um so Hobbes is right he started writing this during the Civil Wars and he's finished it just after and so a lot of the things that he's saying must be read in the context of breakdown of government and and civil war and and this this kind of fear of rebellion and resistance and um division within a polity he says that in order to understand mankind you must understand yourself because humans are very similar uh and now we get on to part one and so the reason he's saying that you must understand yourself is and, and man is is because he's now going on to discuss he, sort of his kind of ethical theory his his sense of what a, what makes a man so that's part one. Um, he says that, uh, but basically, also I'm just another structural note. I've div- I've have covered each chapter, but I'm not going to read out the chapter titles each time. I'm just going to keep talking. Um, but it's just more so that you can follow it easier. So singly, the thoughts of man are all representations of appearances of objects. The original is sense, so that the original appearance. This is caused by an external body or object touching the sensory organ. And then he lists the senses and their equivalent sense organs. Everyone knows that when a thing lies still, it will lie still forever, unless something else stirs it. Um, But less people assent to the universal truth that when a thing is in motion, it will eternally be in motion unless something stops it. He says that this is despite the same reasoning um, that nothing can change itself. So in the same way, when we see an object, we will retain an image of the thing we've seen, even when we close our eyes or when it is removed. And this is called imagination. Imagination, therefore, is nothing but decaying sense. Um, He says that the longer in time after seeing or sensing the object, the weaker the imagination, um, because the sun obscures it or or whatever. Um, And so after a great distance of time, our imagination of the past is weak. Um, And so when we express this decaying sense as decay, as opposed to as sense, it is called memory. So... In, a, in essence, he's kind of saying that memory, imagination and sense are all the same things, just at different timings and at, um, different perceptions. Memory of many things is called experience. Um, and there is a distinction between simple imagination, which is imagining the whole object as it was presented to the sense, and compounded in imagination, which is um, imagining two things that you've already sensed, but putting them together and so, for example, imagining a centaur after seeing both a horse and a man. Um, imagination when asleep is called dreaming. He says that dreams are the reverse of our waking imaginations. Um, and the rig- religion of the Gentiles in the past, such that worship satyrs and nymphs, etc. Um, so kind of like the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, arose from ignorance of how to distinguish between dreams and true vision. Um Imagination that comes from words or other voluntary signs is called understanding. So yeah, I'm kind of just, I'm going quickly through all of this because it's important, but it's not pivotal yet for his political theory, which is kind of is what I'm focusing on. Um, he says that consequence or train of thoughts is called mental discourse, 
The first sort of mental discourse is unguided, unguided or without design, and the second is more constant and is re- regulated by a desire or design. The discourse of the mind, when it is governed by design, is nothing but seeking, or the faculty of invention, a hunting out of the causes of some effect, present or the past, or of the effects of some present or past cause. He defines remembrance, prudence and signs. Um, And he says that prudence is a presumption of the future contracted from the experience of time past. Everything we imagine is finite. Um, The name of God is used not to make us conceive him, as he is incomprehensible, but so that we may honour him. The invention of printing is nothing compared to the invention of letters. However, the most notable invention was that of speech. So the first author of speech was God, instructing Adam how to name creatures. And then Adam and his posterity developed language but this was all lost at the tower of babel when every man was stricken by god for his rebellion people dispersed to different parts of the world and this is why we have different languages um hobbes common to a sort of representative of his time um captures a lot of his theories typically not less the political ones actually more his ethical and religious theories but he, he sort of couches them in biblical scripture Um, he says that the general use of speech is to transfer our mental discourse into verbal or the train of our thoughts into a train of words there are the uses of speech are to express what we think to be the cause or effect of something to counsel and teach and to let others know our wills or for pleasure and these uses have four correspondent abuses there are proper names i.e john this man this tree and common names i.e man tree horse Without words, there is no possibility of numbering, and also true or false are attributes of speech. He outlines the need for definitions and the distinction between names positive and names negative. When a man, upon the hearing of any speech, hath those thoughts which the words of that speech and their connection were ordained and constituted to signify, then he is said to understand it. Reason, in this sense, is nothing but reckoning, that is, adding and subtracting, of the cons. I spelled that wrong, subtracting, of the consequences of general names agreed upon for the marking and signifying of our thoughts. The use of reason is to begin at the the first definitions of names, etc., and proceed from one consequence to another. He discusses error and absurdity, and then says, reason is not as sense and memory born with us, nor gotten by experience only, as prudence is, but attained by industry. So you have to kind of, you have to work to get to develop your reason. Science is the knowledge of consequences and dependence of one fact upon another. He says that animals have two sorts of motions peculiar to them. Vital, such as um, which are involuntary motions like the course of blood, the pulse, breathing. And then animal or voluntary, such as um, making speech and moving limbs. He says that the imagination is always the first internal beginning of all voluntary motion. These small beginnings of motion within the body of man, before they appear in walking, speaking, striking, and other visible actions, are all commonly called endeavour. Endeavour, when it is towards something which with causes it, is called appetite or desire. And when endeavour is away from something, it is called aversion. That which men desire, they are said to love. And that for which they have an aversion, they are said to hate. Those things which we neither desire nor hate, we have contempt for, um, because contempt is nothing but an immobility of the heart. The object of man's desire is called good, at least in his mind, while the object of aversion, his aversion, is evil. Um, And we call pleasure the sense of good, um, and displeasure the sense of evil. He then goes on to list and very briefly outline the passions, which there is a list of here it's a very long chapter um i kind of think it's a bit unnecessary but there it is um one thing to point out though is that he distinguishes religion from superstition only by their legality so superstition is fear of an invisible power that is not allowed um whereas he says that religion is fear of an invisible power so um which is it's quite an interesting that he that legality is kind of the main thing that distinguishes these two things. Um, you you'd have thought he'd be more critical of superstition, 
He does then go on to say that true religion is when the power imagined is truly as we imagine. Um, but it still seems to be quite a secular view of religion. Um, of all discourse governed by desire of knowledge, there is an end. The last opinion in search of the truth of the past and future is called the judgment. No discourse whatsoever can end in absolute knowledge of fact, past or to come. And when a man's discourse begins, not at definitions, but at some contemplation of his own, it is called an opinion, and the resolution is called belief or faith. Virtue, generally in all sorts of subjects, is somewhat that is valued for eminence and consisteth in comparison. Intellectual virtues are abilities of the mind, which are also called good wit, and these virtues are of two sorts, natural and acquired. Natural means that wit which is gotten by use and experience. A slow wit here is stupidity or dullness. Good judgment is discretion. Acquired wit is reason, which is grounded on the right use of speech and produces the sciences. The causes of the difference of wits are the passions. Um, and then he also discusses giddiness, madness, rage and melancholy. He goes on to say that there are two kinds of knowledge. Knowledge of fact and knowledge of the consequence of one um, of affirmation to the other. Sorry, sorry, let me say that again. There are two kinds of knowledge, knowledge of fact and knowledge of the consequence of affirmation to another, of one affirmation to another, sorry, a typo. The former is just sense and memory. So knowledge of fact is just sense and memory and is absolute knowledge, whereas the latter is science and is conditional. The power of a man to take it universally is his present means to obtain some future apparent good. And this can be either original or instrumental. Natural power is the eminence of the faculties of body or mind, for example, extraordinary strength of prudence. Instrumental powers are those acquired and which are means and instruments to acquire more, for example, riches, reputation and good luck. The greatest of human powers is that which is compounded of the powers of most men, united by consent in one person, natural or civil, that has the use of all their powers depending on his will, such as is the power of a commonwealth. So at the moment, we're still in his sort of ethical theory, and we're going to move on to his political theory in part two. But um, what is significant here is that the greatest human power is actually the power of the commonwealth, because it is the combination of all of its citizens' powers in united into one person into the sovereign he goes on to list a number of particular powers such as having friends having servants um which is joined with liberality and reputation of power he says that the value or worth of a man is his price such as, um, which is what he would be given for the use of his power and the public worth of a man the value set on him by the commonwealth is called dignity and it's conveyed by offices and titles to pray to another, to obey, to give great gifts to a man, to flatter, to show signs of love or fear, etc., 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 is to honour. Um, so this is the chapter on the difference of manners. And by manners, Hobbes doesn't mean decency of behaviour, but the qualities of mankind that concern peaceful living together. I put for a general inclination of all mankind a perpetual and restless desire of power after power that ceases only in death. He cannot assure the power and means to live well, which he already has without the acquisition of more. Um, that's why men always seek, desire, seek more power um, until they die, because they always need to secure their, their power with more power. And therefore, kings who have the greatest power assure it at home with laws or abroad with wars. After this, they develop a desire for a new conquest. And he says that desire of ease and sensual delight disposeth men to obey a common power. The fear of invisible things is... <laughs> I'm really sorry that the, the typos here are going to be quite a lot because this is a very long text and I was very tired when I made this, but just ignore them <laughs> if you can. Um, so the fear of invisible things is the natural seed which everyone calls religion. The only signs or fruit of a religion are in man, and therefore this seed of religion is in man only. It is peculiar to the nature of man to be inquisitive into the causes of the events that they see. So he's saying 
peculiar to man in contrast to other animals. So in Hobbes's view, no other animals have religion because no other animals are curious about the reasons for things. The acknowledging of one God eternal, infinite and omnipotent may more easily be derived from the desire men have to know the causes of natural bodies and their several virtues and operations than um, than from the fear of what was to befall them in time to come. He that, from any effect he sees, should reason that there are causes, would at last conclude that there must be one first mover. So he's, he's saying that it's logical to come to this conclusion that there must be some something like a god that began everything. He then discusses the soul of man. And then these four things, opinion of ghost, ignorance of second causes, devotion towards what men fear, and taking of things ca- casual for prognostics, consisteth the natural seed of religion. From this, different ceremonies and religions have developed. He discusses the religion of Gentiles, i.e., those who don't believe in the Christianity that he believes in. He says that the first founders and legislators of commonwealths um, among the Gentiles, such as Numa Pompilius, who was a um, Roman, the, kind of the guy who founded the Roman churches. Um, they, so he says that they, these, these first founders and legislators also created religions to help keep people in obedience and peace, um, to say that their laws came from God. Um, and religion also diverted discontent away from the government um, because people were entertained or distracted by festivals and public games. And therefore, the Romans, that had conquered the greatest part of, then, of the then known world, made no scruple of tolerating any religion whatsoever in the city of Rome itself. So again, this is interesting because he's he's giving a very utilitarian view of religion when he's supposedly a devout Christian. So contemporaries were much more you know they wouldn't they wouldn't say religion is good because it makes it diverts discontent away from the government or or it keeps people obedient they'd say religion is good because it is true and god made us and god is great and all this stuff so it's very very interesting that he's kind of presenting a utilitarian um outlook on religious matters Although he does then say, where the true God, via supernatural revelation, planted religion, he made himself a kingdom with laws. Um, so it's not like he's discarding faith. He's saying that there is one true God. But he's kind of disregarding organised religion and saying that the he's keeping a faith in God, but he's not necessarily keeping an, an adherence to actual organized religion of his time which is going to be important later now is the doctrine of natural equality which is vital for hobbes so nature hath made men so equal so if even the weakest man can kill the strongest um it might not be by by strength but it might be by scheming or confederacy with others and so overall men are equal Prudence is just experience, and time is equally bestowed upon men. Therefore, all men develop experience at the same, have the same time to develop experience. And from this equality of ability ariseth equality of hope in the attaining of our ends. Therefore, if any two men desire the same thing, but cannot both enjoy it, they become enemies. And in the name of their end, which is principally self-preservation, they seek to destroy one another. So he kind of demonstrating the origins of war here. Um, He says that men have no pleasure in keeping company when there is no power able to overawe them. This is, again, a very, very different sentiment from Aristotle's man is by nature a political animal. Um, The crux of Aristotle's theory is that humans are inherently social and it is natural for us to want to live together and, and work together for self um not for self-preservation sorry for self-sufficiency whereas Hobbes is saying it's not actually natural for us to want to work together um it's natural for us to be at odds with one another 
and as we seek to preserve ourselves. Um, and it's, it is only when we sort of overcome our natural impulses that we can become, we can sort of live together in a society. So basically, there is such a thing as the state of nature, which is the condition that humans are in before they enter a commonwealth or before they join a political society when it's just sort of humans, you know, you're only out for yourself. There are other humans there, but there's no there's no common government, there's no common society. So this, in the nature of man, there are three principal causes of quarrel. Competition, diffidence and glory. The first makes men invade for gain, the second for safety and the third for reputation. And therefore the state of nature is also a state of war. During the time men live without a common power to keep them all in awe, they are in that condition which is called war. And such a war as is of every man against every man. And war is not just battle or fighting, but it's the time in which the will to contend by battle is sufficiently known. And so the notion of time is to be considered in the nature of war. In the state of nature, there is no place for industry because its fruit is uncertain. Therefore, there is no farming, no navigation, no commodious building, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society. And people live in constant fear and danger. And this um, has brought Hobbes to say the famous quote that the life of man in the state of nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. So he's really, he's really, really, really emphasising how bad it is and how unhappy it is to live in this state of nature with no common power and no common government. He says that while people may think this conclusion seems strange, think of the way men in the English Commonwealth behave, even though there are laws which revenge all injuries. Um, so men at this time, apparently, still arm themselves when riding out. They still go accompanied they still lock their doors when they sleep and lock their chests even when they're in their house um and so even uh, even though the english commonwealth at this point in time has um common laws and a way of enforcing them people still don't really trust one another and Hobbes says that this is as much as an accusation against mankind as Hobbes's words. So he's kind of saying everyone believes it in the fact that they don't go out unarmed and the fact that they do lock everything in case of burglary. They are accusing mankind of, of this sort of base nature in the same way that Hobbes is, but Hobbes is vocalising it. The desires and other passions of man are in themselves no sin. No more are the actions that proceed from those passions till they know a law that forbids them. So he's also kind of saying that there is nothing, the only thing that determines something as wrong is law. Um, nothing is sinful if there's no law to say it's sinful. There are many places in which the state of nature still exists. Um, again, this is written in 1651. And Hobbes points out, um, particularly he, he points out the Native Americans. I mean, he uses a much more uh, offensive word to describe them, but... It, he he talks about sort of the, the 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 people who are living in Native America at the time, and says that they are still living in this state of nature, um, and so he's kind of showing that it's he's he's using them as proof that it still exists. Again, very questionable and offensive to contemporary, uh, sorry to modern readers, but that is part of his argument. He also says that. Another example is when men who used to live under a peaceful government degenerate into civil war, i.e. they go back to the state of nature. And he also says that the international fear is still in a state of nature. So kings and persons of sovereign authority, because of their independency, are in continual jealousies and in the state and posture of gladiators. But because they uphold thereby the industry of their subjects, there does not follow from it that misery which accompanies the liberty of particular men. So nothing can be unjust in the state of nature because where there is no common power, there is no law. 
and where no law, no injustice. So this is a legal positivist um, view. He denies that laws need to be moral, right or good in order to be laws. They are just procedural. There is no property, sorry, propriety or dominion. What you can get is yours for as long as you can keep it. But if you lose it, your loss. There is a possibility to get out of this natural condition through both the passions and reason. The passions that incline men to peace are fear of death, desire of such things as are necessary to commodious living, and a hope by their industry to obtain them. Um, and reason suggests convenient articles of peace. And these articles of peace are the laws of nature. So what Hobbes is doing is he's showing that he's showing the state of nature, which is the state in which humans are born naturally and he's showing that it's negative and he's showing that it's it's a state of fear it's a state of war and he's then showing how humans can get out of this state and it is through their passions i.e their feelings and their emotions and thoughts and their reason and that these are the laws of nature so the right of nature also called called just natural is the liberty each man hath to use his own power as he will himself for the preservation of his own nature, that is to say, of his own life, and consequently of doing anything which in his own judgment and reason he shall conceive to be the aptest means thereunto. So in other words, the right of nature is to protect yourself. That is our everyone's natural right, that is what we were born with, that is kind of our our main reason of reason in existing. Liberty means the absence of external impediments. A law of nature is a general rule, discovered through reason, and a man is forbidden to do that which is destructive of his life and must actively preserve his life. Um, there is a famous thesis called the Taylor Warrender thesis, which says that there is a distinction between Hobbes's ethical doctrine and his account of human nature. And therefore, the laws of nature are logically unrelated to his description of human nature. He says that there is um, a difference between right and law. Um, rights consist in the liberty to do something, whereas law is binding. So it kind of like right says you can do this if you want. Like you are free to do this, whereas law says you must do this. In the state of nature, every man has a right to everything, even another's body. As long as this natural right endures, there can be no security. And therefore, our natural reason shows us that the first and fundamental law of nature is to seek peace and follow it. Um, however, if peace fails, then we must commit to war. Because again, it is about self-preservation. The second law of nature is is that a man must be willing, when others are too, to lay down his right to all things. Um, he must be willing to have as much liberty himself as he would allow other men against himself. Um, and so, in other words, he must contract in the way of peace. Um, he said, uh, The quote for this is, to lay down a man's right to anything is to divest himself of the liberty of hindering another of the benefit of his own right to the same. So he says that right is laid aside either by renouncing it or transferring it to another. When a man renounces or transfers his right, it is in consideration of a good for himself. It is a voluntary act and all voluntary acts are for man's own good because it is irrational and therefore in Hobbes's view, just you won't do it, um, to voluntarily do something that is not for your own good. This rests on a conception of human nature as inherently selfish. And then the mutual transferring of rights. So if two men transfer right, their rights at the same time, um, this is a contract. If one of the contractors delivers the thing contracted for on his part, leaving and trusting the other to perform his part at a different time, then the contract on his part is a covenant. When the transferring of right is not mutual, but one of the parties transfers in hopes of gaining friendship or service, it is called a gift. Signs of contract are either explicit or by inference. 
If a covenant is made in which neither party performs straight away, it is void in the state of nature. However, if there is a common power with sufficient force to compel performance, this covenant isn't void. It's impossible to covenant with beasts because they don't understand our speech, nor can they translate any right to another. Men are free of covenants in two ways, either by performing or by being forgiveness. And forgiveness is therefore the restitution of liberty. A former covenant makes void a, li a later if they clash. Also, a covenant to accuse oneself without assurance of pardon is likewise invalid. Oath, um, an oath is swearing in front of God of the God you fear, um, which is all that can be done without a civil power. So again, he's, he's continually making a case for the need for a civil, common, coercive power. Third, the third law, law of nature is that man perform their covenants made. This is the foundation of justice. So injustice is failing to perform a covenant. However, because covenants um, of mutual trust are invalid, before the names of just and unjust can have place, there must be some coercive power to compel men equally to the performance of their covenants. But there is no such power before the Commonwealth. Some think that it is just a breach covenant if it is conducive to the attainment of eternal happiness after life. But there is no natural knowledge of man's estate after death. So, again, he's making an allusion to the civil war here. He's saying that so, like some of the arguments of the rebels was that you could rebel against a sovereign power if it was in the name of God or to help if this rebellion would help you reach heaven but Hobbes is saying that that's not a valid argument because we don't know if heaven exists or we don't know what happens after death the only things we know are the things that our natural reason can tell us and so while people think this Hobbes is saying he's not so sure that that this heaven and hell exists um and therefore because because we have no knowledge of it we've no reason to believe that um, it, this is not a legitimate argument for breaching a covenant. He discusses the, the distinction between justice of manners and justice of action. Guilt is associated only with justice of action. Justice of action is divided into commutative and distributive. Justice depends on antecedent covenant, and so gratitude depends on antecedent grace. The fourth law of nature is that a man who receives benefit from another of mere grace endeavours that he who gave the gift will have no reasonable cause to regret his goodwill. Um, a breach of this law is ingratitude. The fifth law of nature is complacence. Every man must strive to accommodate himself to the rest. Observers of this law may be called sociable. The sixth law of nature is upon caution of the future time, a man should pardon the offences of those that repent. Pardon is nothing but granting of peace, which is the fundamental law of nature. The seventh law of nature is, in revenge, men should look not at the greatness of the evil past, but of the good to follow. Forbidden from inflicting punishment with any design other than the correction of the offender or direction of others. The eighth law of nature is that no man by deed, word, countenance or gesture declare hatred or contempt of another. And the ninth law of nature is that every man acknowledge that nature has made them equal. This is, a, a, again, a step away from Aristotelian critical theory because he's saying that he's criticising um, the Aristotelian doctrine of natural hierarchy and natural slavery. The tenth law of nature is that on entry into conditions of peace, no man may require to reserve to himself any right which he is not content to allow for anyone else. Observers of this law are modest and breakers are arrogant. The eleventh law of nature is that if a man is trusted to judge between man and man, he must deal equally between them. This is equity. The twelfth law of nature is um, the equal use of things in common. The thirteenth is that things can neither be divided nor enjoyed in common. Um, they should be they, so things that can neither be divided nor enjoyed in common should be decided by lot. Um, speaking of laws of nature. Watkins defends Hobbes from charges that he is guilty of the naturalistic fallacy, i.e. deriving moral conclusions from moral premises, by arguing that the laws of nature are, more, are not moral prescriptions because they are assertoric hypothetical imperatives. 
Okay, uh, the fourteenth law of nature is primogen of is of primogeniture and first seizing. The fifteenth is that all men that mediate peace should be allowed safe conduct. The sixteenth is that men must submit to arbitrament. The seventeenth is that no man is his own judge. The eighteenth is that no man should be a judge that has in him a natural cause of partiality. The nineteenth is that witnesses should be treated equally. These laws of nature dictate peace for the conservation of men in multitudes. And this is the doctrine of civil society. The laws of nature are eternal, immutable and easy to observe. Um, And the science of these laws of nature is the true and only moral philosophy. So I apologise, that was really lengthy. um, But sort of laws of nature are fundamental. Okay. Here's where it starts to get a bit more interesting. So he says that a person is he whose words or actions are considered either as his own or as representing the words or actions of another man or of any other thing to whom they are attributed, whether truly or by fiction. When the words um, slash actions are considered his own, he is a natural person. When the words or actions of a person are considered as representing the words or actions of another, he is a feigned or artificial person. The word person is Latin, signifying the disguise or outwards appearance of a man, counterfeited on stage, so an actor. From the stage has been translated um, to any representer of speech and action. So a person is an actor, um, and to personate is to act. Some artificial persons um, have their words and actions owned by those whom they represent, and the owner is called the author, while the actor acts by authority. So uh, this is this is really complicated, but basically it's a theory of representation. So s- somebody, a person, can sort of say or do things in the name of someone else and the idea is that if if this someone else has given authority so said yes I willingly accept that you are going to impersonate me you're going to represent me to someone else or in in a way then that means, in Hobbes's view, that the words or actions of the impersonator, or in his term, actor, are owned by the author. Um, I'm just trying to think of a contemporary example. Um, so, okay, so think of a social media manager. C- celebrities have people who run their their Twitter, okay? And the, the tweets of Beyonce, for example, say that she's not tweeting them herself. It's someone else. Everything that Beyonce's Twitter account says is considered to be a representation of Beyonce herself. According to Hobbes, what this means is that Beyonce has given authority to her Twitter person, her Twitter manager, to tweet on her behalf. And so even though she is not actually the person who writes the tweets, the argument is that it is basically the same as her saying the tweets herself because she has given that authority and it is that authority to allow someone else to impersonate you that removes your ability to remove to separate yourself from what they say and do that is not to say that Beyonce doesn't make her own tweets I've no idea um it's just an example but it, it's it's a it's a theory of representation someone else is representing re- representing you sorry and you have given them permission to do that, and therefore anything they do after after you've given them permission 
is on your head it's it's by your authority therefore it's basically like you've done it yourself okay so from hence it followeth that when the actor maketh a covenant by authority he bindeth thereby the author no less than if he had made it himself then there are fictitious persons so we've, we've talked about natural persons who are the people who just do the like act on their own behalf beyonce is a natural person we've talked about artificial persons these are the people who represent one another person so beyonce's twitter manager is her artificial person and now we have fictitious persons so there are a few things that cannot be represented represented by fiction inanimate things like a church hospital or bridge may be personated by a rector a master or an overseer but these inanimate things cannot be author nor give authority to their actors because they are objects however the actors may have authority to procure their maintenance and such things cannot be personated before there be some state of civil government so again you can you can do you can do things in the name of the bridge like you can someone who is who is in charge of caring for the bridge can go and get things to fix it if it breaks in the name of the bridge but that bridge has not given authority for them to do that because it's a bridge it can't it can't make decisions it has no reason and so the person who is caring for that bridge is a fictitious person because they're doing it they're, they're doing it for something that isn't real but they're still representing it um, but his argument is that this representation can't happen unless there is a commonwealth or some sort of civil government similarly children and fools may be personated by guardians but they cannot be authors false idols may be personated as may the true god for example, when Moses governed the Israelites in God's name. Um, and now we're getting to the, the commonwealth and the sovereign. So a multitude of men are made one person when they are by one man or one person represented. So that it be done with the consent of every one of that multitude in particular. For it is the unity of the representer, not the unity of the represented, that maketh the person one. So this is a reformulation of what he wrote in De Civi, which is um, an earlier book um, that he wrote. Hobbes is saying that the multitude can only be united within the sovereign. And this removes the possibility of allowing the multitude unity that could be used against the sovereign. So basically, everyone lives in this, in this, in this horrible state of nature until... Until they are represented communally. So, until they have someone who will act on their behalf. As we've just seen, they must authorise this acting on their behalf. Um, but this authorisation happens only when they have joined into this one person so they 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 basically they make covenants with the sovereign um so the the person or group of people who will be their leader individually they all agree to submit to him or her but in Hobbes's view him um and it is only once that they have united in this sovereign that they become a unity so this is, again, a critique of the civil war because the argument is that you can't rebel against your sovereign because, like, as a group because you are only a, a group or a multitude when, when that sovereign is representing you. So as soon as the sovereign stops representing you, you're no longer a group and therefore you can't act as one. Um, and it is the representer that beareth the person but one person, and unity cannot otherwise be understood in multitude. So the multitude are many authors of everything their representative says, each giving authority for himself. And the voice of the greater number should be considered the voice of them all. I'm hoping I'm explaining this well. It's very, very confusing. Um, but basically, there is a sovereign, 
who is in charge. He represents the Commonwealth. He represents the state. And he represents the multitude of people who are the citizens of the state. However, they do not become a state. They do not become a multitude until they are represented by the sovereign. 